everyone. Welcome to today's Problem Solutions monthly webinar. We'll be getting started in about five minutes. Hello everyone, we are going to get started now. Thanks for joining this month's installment of PS Problem Solution. Today we'll be talking about flash conversion. Before we kick things off, uh, we have a really short time today, so we're just gonna flash Lisa's um, office hours so you can get in touch with her at any time. 
Um, the problem solution series is a series that we put together for clients by clients. So it is an opportunity for you to send us your problems and we will solve them for the benefit of all. As a bonus today, we are joined by our client Manhattan Associates. Please welcome Stephanie Crow. Hello, Stephanie. Hello, everyone. <laughs> A little housekeeping, today's webinar will run for one hour from 12 p.m. to 1 p.m. Central Time. Um, let's talk about the control panel. You will see on the top corner an orange tab with a white arrow. This allows you to collapse and expand your control panel. For audio, everyone is in listen-only mode. You have two audio options, either via your computer speakers or your landline. You'll find the phone number in the original invitation and also on your control panel, right here. If you find the screen is too small, you can enlarge it to fit your full viewing screen by clicking on this box right here. Sky, you're doing such a nice job coloring in as she goes. <laughs> <laughs> Chat is available today via the questions pane. We welcome any questions and comments that you have, and we'll be stopping several times throughout the webinar to answer them. So please submit them as you have them. Okay, let's do a quick practice. We would love to hear where you're joining us from today. So just go to your questions panel and let us know where you're joining us from, and we'll read a few off. Ooh, lots of people from Texas. Fabulous. Awesome. Great. All right. Um, if you have any audio or visual issues, please submit a comment to your questions pane. Rich Peterson will reach out to you and help you solve the problem. Today's session is being recorded. We will email out a link after the presentation within 24 hours. My name is Hillary Simonson. I'm the marketing manager here at Allen Interactions, and I'll be monitoring and responding to your questions during the broadcast today. Our hosts are Allen Interactions Strategic Relationship Manager, Lisa Stortz, and our solutions architect and co-founder, Scott Kohlauer. Say hi, Scott. Hello, everyone. Okay, last thing from me. We'll have several polls throughout the webinar today. Launching our polls is Rich Peterson, Allen Interactions Relationship Manager. Looks like Rich is ready to launch the first one right now. So that's all for me. Take it away, guys. Great. As you can see, thanks so much, Hillary. As you can see, Rich is launching, launching the first poll. Um, and we just want to get a good idea where everyone's coming from today as far as your role in the organization. And that'll just help us tailor today's session. So go ahead and let us know how you would describe your role, manager and director, Manager or director, senior instructional designer or project manager, instructional designer, developer, training specialist, or other, and you can add anything in the question window. So, Rachel, let me know when that poll's ready. There we go. All right. So, instructional designers, developers, and training specialists by far, 50%, managers, uh, almost 20%, senior IDs, 26, and other, eight. Perfect. Well, thanks so much. With that, again, we really are so grateful to have Manhattan Associates with us. Um, Stephanie Crow has joined us, and Layla was going to join us. She had a little car trouble, so she may be popping in later if we hear another voice. So, Stephanie, thanks again so much for joining us today. Absolutely. Glad to be here. Perfect. So we just have a few questions for Stephanie. She did um, do a flash conversion project, so it's always great to get the client's perspective on that. So um, why don't you share a little bit with us about Manhattan Associates, what your company is about? Sure. Well, we are a, a technology software and services company. We provide competitive solutions in the supply chain commerce uh, environment. So, so we're really all about helping uh, companies deploy omni-channel solutions uh, and getting goods to their consumers in the speediest, most efficient, profitable way possible. Oh, that's fabulous. And what about the course that we're going to be talking about? And we'll be spending the majority of the webinar today or a good portion of it going through, through some of the work. But tell us a little bit about the course and who the audience was, your desired performance outcomes. Sure. The snapshot you're looking at is actually part of a larger curriculum on supply chain commerce domain. As you can imagine, we've got a lot of great technical folks, folks who design software and implement solutions, but they don't always know the context within which they're building solutions for the industry. So what we wanted to do was to really empower our employees and eventually our customers who are IT professionals themselves within their own companies with the context of what they're living in. So uh, the supply chain commerce, the supply chain uh, 
functions, um, the roles, how it operates, what the critical success factors are within a supply chain, commerce, what's happening in omnichannel commerce, distribution centers, inventory optimization, things like that. Perfect. Great. So it, why did you decide to convert or why did you feel compelled that you needed to? Well, certainly we had that good, um, scary uh-oh about uh, flash <laughs> going away. So that was part of it. This is really intended to be somewhat evergreen content. Certainly there is there are innovations going on in supply chain commerce, but there are basics that don't change. So we had intended to create this as evergreen content and we want to keep deploying it. So that was number one. Um, but secondly, also, uh, we wanted to have a multi-mode deployment. And although we did originally make it possible for multiple, uh, you know, sort of interfaces uh, for people to experience, um, it wasn't responsive. And so those are the two key reasons to go from Flash to HTML5. Oh, that's fabulous. And what else did you think about when you were looking to convert? Was there anything else? Did you, just, did you want to edit content or look and feel? Or where were you at with all of that? Sure. Well, it's already very high production quality, um, which is why we went with Allen Interactions, quite frankly. But I will also tell you that we also use this for our customers and resell these courses to our clients. But um, I would say, uh, like any good instructional designer, some of us are on the phone today. Once you crack open a course, you don't want to lose the opportunity to say, you know, I wish I could also do this. So um, our key function really went all of these courses into bite-sized microlearning. Oh, that's awesome. And we will be, again, showing pieces of that as we go through today. That's fabulous. And, and just one last question, a little bit about the process and, and um, how did it go? What was the general overall process for you? Sure. Well, um, quite frankly, it went so well, I know very little about it. <laughs> Um, <laughs> running the group, there's a lot going on, so I'm especially thankful to the Allen Interactions team and uh, Lila Kamal, our, our lead instructional designer, and her team um, for being able to keep this completely, almost totally off my radar. But uh, all joking aside, um, the way the process worked was, um, as you can imagine, we're big believers in the savvy, agile development approach. However, it's, this is almost the exact opposite, where you take a big thing and you chunk it down, as opposed to, you know, sort of quickly turn things on their side and, and get to a quick prototype. So, so we did do um, agile with this, but in terms of take one course, split it up, and then really churn it through a quite agile deployment process. Um, so almost mini micro alpha beta goals um, with every little <laughs> um, and um, and it just it churned and and really produced a lot of results early for us um, you know weekly meetings where I, as I understand it anyway um, where you know reviewing where are we what what can we move forward um, what are we waiting to hear back from the instructional designer the subject matter expertise team from and um, and then Alan interactions really the team there um, being able to manage the project management, the stages and phases and deployment of all of the pieces, um, adopting the feedback quickly and, and getting those conversions tested and deployed. Oh, that's great. And we will talk about the testing and deployment here soon too. Stephanie, again, thank you so much. I think the, um, the easier lift on your side during the conversion and uh, it really speaks to the collaboration we had in the initial course with your team, which was just fabulous because you have such strong design designers on your side as well. And so we just really had a rock solid design. So again, thank you for that. And thank you for joining us today. Thank you. All right, have a great day. Yeah, perfect. So Stephanie mentioned a lot of great reasons um, why to convert in the first place, you know, why and why now. Um, we're gonna go through kind of the top six. So Scott, you wanna start off with a few? Yeah, so, you know, obviously the number one is, is the fear factor. Flash, the fear factor <laughs> that, uh, that, that platform, uh, which has been, you know, near and dear to lots of designers' hearts for years and years is 
going to be going away. Um, 2019 uh, is uh, Microsoft is actually going to disable Flash in in all of their browsers, uh, and so you know that's that's a big deal. Um, <laughs> 2020, uh, Adobe will stop updating and distributing the Flash player, um, and that will probably be you know the end. I'm sure there'll be some some stragglers, mm -hmm. some people that will hang on and and actually mm -hmm. force that uh, that tool set to work for a little bit while longer. But as far as a general distribution, our IT folks are all are all planning for for that phase out uh, in the next you know year and a half or so. And trust us, we're right in the heat of this too. You know, as you can imagine, we have tens of thousands of assets <laughs> built in Flash, so we're uh, we're worrying about this too. There's a lot of technical issues, and we're going to address those in a few of the demos we're going to share today of the different conversions. Um, obviously, the browser compatibility is a huge problem. We're getting calls all the time as browsers continue to update and change. And then the continuing changing of any of the devices, right? It's definitely a BYOD kind of society right now. The PC, the tablet, the phones continue, continue to iterate and change. Yep, and uh, it, it really, um, you know, w one of the things we're gonna talk about is the process and thinking, these are all things that we're gonna be talking about and thinking about in the process of actually doing the conversion. So we'll, we'll bring that up again in a little bit. Um, the, uh, Stephanie mentioned the ability to tweak and, and change content as needed. If there are new ideas, if there are new things that uh, we're seeing uh, are maybe not working in the learning as well, or mm -hmm. if they need to be addressed or changed, um, that's a good time for uh, for a conversion. And in addition, in Manhattan, which we'll show is a great example of this, but they really wanted to chunk and sequence it differently, right? Bring it more into a modernization of the learning, really meet those millennials where they're at at the time of the need. I love how she, <laughs> she uh, said we're well, a YouTube society and they want to look it up and get back to work. So you'll see some examples of the chunking and sequencing and, um, and then modality mix is a big one, right? If you just want to change out some of the modalities. Yep. Um, and then uh, media refresh, uh, we've seen organizations want to, you know, that have, have had flash courses out there for a number of years, want to spruce up the media, do some more branding, or just make it a little more modern looking, if you will, uh, which is a, a, another good time to do this. And then um, obviously maintainability. You know, flash was a, a tool set that, that you needed coders. Um, so is HTML5. We're going to be talking a lot of, about HTML5, but we're also going to be talking about how you can create uh, external, externalized text and content, videos and things like that that can be updated very easily uh, and then uh, ported back into the, the delivery mechanism, which is uh, uh, the tool set. And obviously, that um, you know, there are lots of tools that you can convert courses to, and we're going to be talking about that next. Yep, it's a great time, the convergence of the uh, technology for the tool set. Any, any, any questions that we've got? Yeah, keep the questions coming in the uh, question panel, too. Um, as Scott mentioned, the, um, a couple of examples we're going to show today are what you're hearing a lot in the market, right? It's Flash to HTML5 and either responsive or adaptive, and we're going to cover off on that. But we definitely recognize there's lots of other tool sets. We're going to give you examples of where we converted to Storyline. Um, we're definitely, you know, Captivate, Lectora. Um, whatever it might be. So lots of different examples. Scott alluded to the process a little bit earlier. We're going to go through this a little quickly so we can get to examples. But Scott, you want to kind of cover off on the process? Yeah. So so obviously the, the first phase is assessing whatever that content is, that Flash course is. Um, you know, understanding what the organization's tool set requirements are, uh, whether that, that course can actually be ported to those tool sets, and all the different uh, components along with that. Um, understanding the, the complexity of, and type of, of activities, gamification and components that were built into those Flash. Some Flash is, is just a, you know, you, Flash can be a video, it can be a, an animation, or it can be a very sophisticated, you know, interactivity with gaming. And so we want to take a look at that and really understand those complexities and how it would port to different tool sets and types. Um, the the media mix, you know, the graphics, the audio, text, sounds, um, any standards that we need to look forward uh, through uh, SCORM, AICC, XAPI, TINCAN. Um, how do we want to take these new courses, and how does that fit into your your learning management system or your delivery systems as they currently stand uh, today? 
Um, and then another one is uh, is the 508 uh, and, and WCAG, WCAG, which WCAG is affording us a lot more opportunities, right, to make more courses accessible. It's you know it's definitely designed for web type applications rather than the old um, 508 standards. So we're seeing a lot of opportunities um, with that to take that into account now. Hey Scott, just before you move on, just two really good questions. Um, Someone's commenting that what's a good analogy to use to explain the whole change to someone who doesn't understand tools in general? Um. <laughs> maybe maybe the old TV dial to a uh, <laughs> black yeah. and white. Yeah, I, uh, you know the the. <laughs> That's a really good question. Yeah. I haven't thought about that. We'll ponder that one and then we'll, we'll get, hold yeah. on that. And then um, someone else had commented on the limitations. They feel that there's some limitations with HTML5 with regard to animations, which I don't know if we've run into that. Actually. You know, um, there, there really is almost, it's, it's limited. HTML5 slash JavaScript, because JavaScript is typically the bulk of it and it's put through the HTML5 wrapper. Um, we can go into lots of details, but there are almost limitless uh, amounts of animation that can be done in uh, in those tool sets. And so, so David, let us know um, what specifically, because we can we have a series of guilds here at Allen Interactions, and we do have a developer guild, so we can absolutely throw that to that group and get you some response on that. Yep. So cool, Scott. You want to keep going there? Okay. So um, then, after you assess it and look at it, then you're looking at what what do we need to do as far as design. Um, and oftentimes, uh, companies are going to say, I just want a one-to-one -one conversion. I don't want to do anything. It's, it's, the content's fine. The look and feel is fine. And I'm just going to do a one-to-one. -one. So now we just have to, to recode it in the tool set and make any, uh, if, if you're using a, a more of an off-the-shelf tool set, depending on how that course was created, there may be uh, design considerations that you need to take uh, to look at and and maybe modify some of those. And we're going to be talking about some of these things as show we show, examples, show yeah. some examples. Um, obviously, the development tool, uh, does that require the redesign? Uh, and if they do, when we design it, look at chunking and sequencing. Um, the, the Manhattan group, they had a number of courses. Those courses had lessons. Uh, the one in particular we were showing had four lessons that actually broke down into, I believe, 12 micro learnings once we looked at it and resequenced mm -hmm. it and recrunched it. Um, do we want to do more scenario based? If you're learning back, you know, a number of years ago was more presentation, do we want to create that into more active learning, scenario based learning, and, and take the time to do that? Um, obviously, uh, just content updates, content that is mm -hmm. changed, updated. Um, and then maybe a media refresh. So those are all options. Some people do everything. Some mm -hmm. people do nothing. And some so. just do the one-to-one. -one. And we're going to show you examples of all those. Yeah. Um, in, in the development phase, obviously, uh, understanding the, the authoring tool, um, we look at uh, things like how do we want to, if, if it's needed, if it's a, a course that we want to deploy across different uh, types of devices, such as phone, tablet, uh, we're going to look at a couple of different uh, components, responsive and adaptive. They're very different, and I think it's important to know those things. We're going to show you some examples of that and how those those two major types of, of reformatting uh, frameworks are, are working. Shrink is basically you just take what you have and you smush it down <laughs> in the same, the same size, uh, the same layout and everything, and you just it just plays on a smaller device which, depending on the original design, can be very frustrating for the learner. But it, it could, it, it might not. It might have been designed in a way that everything, larger buttons, larger texts, and things like that, that, that would shrink appropriately. Um, browser compatibilities, uh, the, uh, the ability to make models and templates, depending on how the course originally was designed, can we create models and templates that we can flow this into and really make it a more uh, structured and process approach to conversion. We, we take mm -hmm. a look at that in the development phase. Um, and then I'll also, we talked about the maintenance. Yeah. Which, um, and we should point out, all these are iterative, right? Because, of course, you want to assess everything up front, but once you really get deep into development, you need to really double back and make sure you're still um, on target with it. Yep. Um, and then quality, quality assurance. Um, 
again, going back, really testing, understanding how these things are going to be looked, uh, how are they going to be, inter uh, the interface is going to feel to that user on the desktop, on the mobile devices. Um, browsers are very different. If we're opening them up, mm -hmm. you know, like Manhattan, they're going to be selling these and, and providing these to all of their customers. So they have a very broad uh, spectrum of what this needs to play on, um, where some organizations might say, you know, we're on this browser and we're on this device mm -hmm. and that's it. And so taking all that into consideration when um, when doing this conversion is a, an important concept. So testing is critical and especially through the deployment phase, um, you know, as you test it on your LMS yep. and the devices, et cetera. So with that, let's get to some examples. We're gonna go through a little bit on adaptive and responsive, possibly shrink or smush as I mentioned earlier. So um, let's go to the um, questions pane. How many of you are familiar with adaptive versus responsive? Um, now in this case, we're using adaptive as far as how it's deployed, not adaptive learning as in teeing up different content for different learners. So go to the question window, let us know um, your familiarity with adaptive versus responsive, so we'll know how deep to go on this. Um, and any questions you may have particularly around adaptive versus responsive as Scott goes through this. Yeah, so um, we're gonna just use Manhattan as an example of this and what, they, what their thought process was. Um, they actually did an adaptive design as opposed to a responsive design. Um, so this was the original flash course. We're going to jump to uh, one of the, uh, the micro modules on understanding KPIs around supply chain management. Um, and you're going to see, you know, there are things uh, like clouds moving by and, and things like that that were animated in uh, flash. We've got this little uh, uh, pointer pointing us to something that, that needs attention. Um, and then all we have all these moving KPIs that, that change and update as you make decisions throughout this uh, this course. Now, if we move over to the HTML5 version, um, which you're seeing, you can see that it's almost an identical uh, recreation um, of that particular uh, course or, or interactivity. Um, you're going to see some things like this uh, this KPI. Uh, uh, panel is going to be shoved down because we want that to take as little space as possible. If it goes to a tablet, it's going to have more uh, leeway around uh, sizing. Um, we've taken out that little pointer and used more of, a, of an animated flash or, or uh, beeping. Or Don't be using the word flash. It's blinking, an HTML5. Animated yeah. blinking <laughs> it's a flash. Um, and you're going to notice, I'm going to just, I'm going to shrink this, this screen down. And when we, when we actually, whoops. Let's see. Sorry about that. Um, when we change the size of this, you're going to notice that it does not responsively shrink to the size of the screen. So this is adaptive. And uh, adaptive actually reads uh, the size of the screen and then uses a format, uh, more of a cas style ca yeah, cascading style sheets, to reposition the content on the screen for that size uh, of, uh, of window. Now, I'm gonna be showing you responsive in a minute, and you're gonna see that the, the, the content actually just flows and changes position, um, but that might not be the best solution for some designs. Uh, if we take, uh, I'm, I've got a little uh, uh, emulator of my phone here. He hooked up his own little version of Chromecast to yeah. <laughs> uh, project his phone into this webinar. It's pretty cool. So, so this is actually playing this uh, this course, this Manhattan course, on on my phone. And when I'm in the portrait mode, it tells me, "Sorry, this course was not designed to be viewed in landscape." It wouldn't give you, it wouldn't give that learner the experience that they needed in this uh, view. So, if I turn it. Um, so I'm just going to rotate so he's it. So physically turning his phone right physically now. Physically turning my phone, and now we can we can actually move through the content. Um, here are uh, are some of those key indicators, and I want to get through this so I can show you. So we can get to the fun game. The the gaming component of it, um, and you're going to see now that that that. That this is shrunk down. The the background, our our panel is taking taken over this particular side of the screen um, because we want it to be large enough for that learner to visually see it. And and as you're making decisions in this little simulation, 
different things are going to be happening over here you're going to be needing to, to watch and keep track of. Now, if it was a responsive design and we we move this, this whole thing might drop down below our visual window and we'd have to scroll mm -hmm. back and forth and that wouldn't be a good experience. So, right. in so this it was critical for them yeah. to have those KPIs yep. visible at all times. Yep. Now, turn your phone again. I want to see it go air out. Perfect. So it airs out and lets you know, again, to put it back to landscape where it was optimized. Yep. Great example. So that adaptive design does not uh, reformat it, it, it just shows a different layout that we previously created for that device, which I think is, is really important. All right. Now let's take another, uh, a, a different view. This one was, uh, this is an HTML5 program that uh, was responsive. And you're gonna see, as we, we see this layout here, um, if I were to take and, and change the size of this, you're gonna see all these different uh, elements uh, move down and reposition themselves on different planes within that uh, within that window. Um, so in this case, it was not as it wasn't as crucial to do adaptive and responsive was okay. It responded to us changing the size of that window um, back and forth, and uh, as the learner is is you know dragging and making selections, you can see how how that uh, plays out um, within this this window. Now, I can go back and I can take a look at, uh, at this same course in, in my window. And again, I have to, to move this up and down, but I can drag and drop things. And now different screens will resize and re-implement themselves. To so in user testing, you know, you're dragging it on the first one on your PC. It, you were dragging it up to the upper right, but we found in user testing too, it really was still a good user experience, even though you had to drag them below and scroll a little bit for this particular um, interaction, which was a little it, very clean. You know, it, it just it didn't lose that much. So responsive design was perfectly fine, and it's Google, Google, right? So they knew they were going to take the majority of their work mobile first. Yeah. Good. So how does that feel, you guys, for the, you know, we're going to show you a few more examples, too, on responsive versus adaptive, but I know there were a lot of questions. A lot of you weren't familiar at all with those terms. So is it feeling a little better, responsive and adaptive? Let us know in the question window, because Hillary will let us know if there's any burning questions. And again, the learning never stops, so we can always follow up with you on this as well. But we just wanted to get kind of those basics. That's a huge consideration now in a, you know, mobile BYOD, really think through that up front in your assessment phase is do you need it fully responsive or do you need it adaptive? And it may vary by, you know, key interaction types, course, course, different things. So, Scott, you want to show us another example of a one-to-one -one conversion? Sure. So, basically, Manhattan was a one-to-one -one pretty much, right? They liked the media. They liked the content. They just wanted to chunk and sequence differently. Yeah, and, we, and there was a – because it was chunked differently – uh, we had to rewrite some introductions into the content that, that would naturally flow during a se different sequence. So there was there was some content areas that we had to take a look at, but uh, but pretty close. Okay, pretty cool. close. Um, Apple clearly was on to this early that they needed to convert. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The the, the Apple folks um, w had flash designs that uh, we had done, and and here they they this was. Uh, harassment um, and some financial uh, informational content. But what one of the things that uh, they wanted was just one-to-one. -one. This was the flash course. Uh, this particular interaction was uh, a, sc a scenario was given to the learner. Uh, different uh, colleagues were giving them advice on how to handle that situation. And uh, you as a learner would have to identify those people that were giving you uh, the good advice. Um, so, so here again, um, was an, an interaction that was uh, just a little more contextual in nature. And they said, you know, we just want you to do the same thing <laughs> in, uh, in HTML5. And so that same exact uh, interaction was recreated within this particular HTML5 component. And they got a one for one. It was fairly straightforward. We used all the same graphics. All the same assets, yeah. Um, one of the things that, that there, you know, people have a lot of questions about is, so I have an older flash course that doesn't have all the assets externalized and I can't reuse those. How do I get those out of flash? 
and there are uh, different rippers, uh, rippers that, that you can buy that will take a, a, a swift course and pull all the, uh, the elements out of that course that then you can use to um, move to an, another type of tool set. Um, it doesn't do it perfectly, but it gets you a good portion of the way uh, to, that, uh, to that end. So very important for media, audio, uh, it doesn't do the animations, uh, but it does do the, the visual elements. Scott, there's an interesting question. How easy is it to go from adaptive to responsive or responsive to adaptive? And easy is probably a scary word. Easy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the questions on Captivate and the responsive ability with that. So I don't know if you can, if there's any way to tie them together. Yeah. Um, so. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to think. I mean, it, it's really a. Did we mention this is live? <laughs> it's really a, a a matter of of you could probably do it. I mean, at some point the learner would have to make a decision whether they want it to be adaptive or responsive. I mean, they're 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 just two different ways of thinking about how that content gets presented. Um, one is more formal formatted, one is more dynamically formatted, the responsive. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, and one's not and necessarily better than the no, other. No, no, right? it just yeah. depends on the yeah. content and, and how you're presenting the materials and what that learner experience is. We actually do have this kind of middle ground that I, you know, that we call adaptive responsive. <laughs> and, and, and it, and it, Don't what, it what it does is, <laughs> is selective, it, it, selective, selective responsive. Yeah and that it, it, it responds, but it takes chunks of visual chunks of things that need to be near each other and, and close to each other in that, in that interface and moves them as one piece instead of small pieces. So, so in that Manhattan one where it was critical that your KPIs were on the screen at all the time, we could have selectively made that adaptive where it, that stays with it all the time and everything else around it responds and shrinks like to the background. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's, yeah, so there's you lots of different the techie guy. lots of different technical <laughs> you know ways to do that and think about it. But these are all important things that to, you know take into consideration when doing these these upgrades and conversions. Yeah, why don't you show the next one, which is um, more, um, uh, you know, we mentioned we've been using a couple examples where it's gone from Flash to um, HTML5, which is very common. I know a lot of you on the line today um, are using Captivate and Storyline and different things. In this example, we're teeing up. They actually had um, some things in Unity and wanted them converted into Storyline. Um, now, Unity obviously publishes out in Flash, but it was Unity into Storyline. So a little bit yeah. of a different example. So th this is just a, a, an animation showing the, the Unity Flash uh, export where learners can move around. They, they have a three-dimensional view and it might not be uh, portrayed on, on our go to meeting as no, well. It's good. It's it's moving it's good. Looking yeah. okay. Um, but you can zoom in, zoom out. Uh, so so that was the that three dimensional navigation, if you will, that was created in these specialty tool sets. Um, the the company said, you know what, we, we really want to go away from those. Um, we we want to be able to update. We don't we wa don't have that want we don't want special programmers. They and were standardizing so on storyline. They were standardizing yeah. on storyline, and so how could you take that that three dimensional movement and and create a similar experience? Um, and so this uh, particular one is is done in storyline, where you've got these uh, navigational buttons on either side that look exactly like the other one, but instead of flowing, it just kind of transitions to that particular uh, component of the room. Um, and you can go back and forth, and then you know select one. Z you're not zooming in, but you're you're getting the the effect. And this is an electrical course where they're uh, they're exploring and trying to understand different uh, power types of uh, requirements um, on a um, on a circuit breaker. So for them, converting to storyline, they wanted it one to one in the sense of the look, media look and feel. The user experience, yeah, that fluidity is pretty cool and the zooming is cool, but you really don't lose that much. Can you click again? Yeah. By, you know, these are just static shots, right? But you're still getting the idea that you're moving around the room for the user and that you can still, you're zooming in in theory, right? But really it's just another static shot that makes it bigger. So you're just not losing that much in the user experience. And they were able to standardize everything on Storyline. So pretty so cool. So these were just design compromises Mm -hmm. based on on 
tool set abilities. <laughs> and when you're moving from one to another, you might have to think about how do I do this a different way while still, you know, creating and maintaining that uh, instructional integrity of the, the course. And I think that this uh, um, accomplished that. Don has a nice comment. Looks like I'm going from analog to digital. <laughs> well, in, in some cases, you're, you're right. I mean, that's, you know, unfortunately, when Flash was a very, very dynamic tool set. And if you're, if you're going to, uh, uh, you know, one of the more standard tool sets, it just doesn't have those capabilities. HTML5 does give us that that complete set of of, um, of options, but again, these are all design considerations that we have to talk through, understand our compromises, understand you know what can make it better, and and maintenance is a big one that we'll be talking about. So. While you're reminiscing there, um, um, senior founder, you want to reminisce about how you miss authorware. <laughs> We're coming up on our 25th anniversary tomorrow for Allen Interactions, and before that, Scott was one of the original um, founders or developers of Authorware. So I think a lot of the people in the shop still miss Authorware too, and now we have to be lamenting Flash on top of yeah, that. So yeah. we have to adapt we have as to, we yeah. move forward in our in our lives. Oh. That's for sure. So in the next example, we're going to show you really they pretty much overhauled everything. We overhauled everything for them. The media needed an update, a uh, modernization look and feel. The content had some tweaks that needed updating while we were at it. And the user experience was really kind of kludgy and um, not very effective. So the user experience, they really wanted to update. They were having a lot of browser compatibility issues. Um, so we pretty much overhauled everything in this one. Yeah, so this was um, this was done for LensCrafters Luxottica on um, understanding and, and selling eyewear. Uh, one of the things that you're seeing on the screen now is just uh, this this little device down here on the bottom was the device that the learners used to navigate and and it, and they just they got a lot of comments that it was hard to use, it was hard to see visually, um, and they wanted a more uh, structured or, or modern mm -hmm. uh, look and feel uh, approach. And so Sylvia is asking what we mean by overhaul. So really we took all the key components, but we updated the media look and feel, we made the content edit changes, and we really evaluated the user interface um, and changed out the user interface, yep. which is what Scott's addressing now. Yeah, because simplification was a component. Um, we wanted all of these things to be there and to be uh, you know, part of, of the interface, but we just wanted to make it a little bit simpler to use. So, um, what will be, sh this is the, the Luxottica uh, uh, redesign, if you will, from, from Flash to HTML5. Um, here on the bottom, um, instead of having that, those previous and next buttons embedded in that thing where they would have to go to the, to the, uh, the left to do it, um, we just made more standard previous and next buttons. Uh, you know, clicking on here gave us the ability to, to bring up the transcript for audio that was doing uh, playing uh, to adjust and, and open and close, adjust the volume, go to help, go to you know glossary and things like that. So all of that in, uh, functionality was there. It's just done differently. And so um, the look and feel. They uh, as we move through here. Um, they wanted to add, again, some, some interactivity. Here is one where uh, people were trying to understand, you know, some basics and, and what we've done is uh, t given the ability to, uh, you know, to say on a cloudy day, things, you know, your eye doesn't see as much light, so your iris opens up. So doing some cause and effect animation uh, within the HTML5 was, was something, just little things like that they wanted to add to enhance that experience. Uh, for for the learner and we were Adam. There's questions too. So this was definitely a, a flash to HTML5, right? And yep. they went HTML5 because they wanted the maximum level of interactivity, right? Which is what yep. we feel and and deliverability across multiple, multiple platforms, platforms right. now. So yeah, it had the mm -hmm. maximum um, interactivity, and with that, then many of you may be thinking, well, we don't have. You know, what about the HTML5 de developers? What if we need, great if we have a third party vendor, you know, such as Allen Interactions develop it, but then what about maintenance? Maintenance can be an enormous issue. Were you gonna go through another nope. example before maintenance? <laughs> great. So the, the convergence of the technology now with um, the adaptability, we wouldn't, probably, we wouldn't probably be developing so much in HTML5 if we hadn't um, 
developed a, many, many ways to make maintenance so much easier because our clients really want to be able to update and maintain their own courseware. So let's go to the questions window. How often do you, um, does your material, the courses you're um, developing and designing, how often do you really need to be doing update and maintenance? How, how much of a pain point is maintenance for you? Go to your um, question window and let us know that. And we'll show you lots of different ways um, that can help on the maintenance side, um, obviously with the tool sets, but also with HTML5. What's the difference between developing an HTML5 and publishing the HTML5 and Storyline? Excellent question, well, Hillary. Question. Thanks. That was uh, <laughs> from our good friend. Karen. Karen. <laughs> so, so HTML5 and Storyline is is basically um, what you can do in Storyline will convert to HTML5. So to play and deploy. To play and deploy, and, and that's great. I mean, that's a that's a consideration that we would look at and say, yes, you know, Storyline can do HTML5, perfect. Are there things that Storyline cannot do that we could do in straight HTML5 development that we want to have that interactive learning experience, you know, uh, come to life? And so there are many times when, when some of those tool sets just do not have the, the capabilities to go to those higher levels. And at that point, then we have to make a business decision. Do we want to, uh, to you know, go straight HTML5 mm -hmm. coding? Now, another component is adapt, you know, going back to the adaptive and the responsive. Um, they're getting better. The tool sets are getting better, but currently, um, there are there are some limited uh, limited tool sets that allow you to do real responsive um, types of designs, but you cannot you cannot do real responsive and adaptive designs in those tools. It's 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 limited. It's more that shrink. I've created a course. I'm going to shrink it down. I'm going to move back and forth mm -hmm. through pages and show videos and things mm -hmm. like that. So when you get into the higher interactive types of courses, simulations, scenarios, mm -hmm. things like that, um, mm -hmm. it, it's it's just not the same. Right. But so they're just business trade-offs, right? It's just a trade-off of you know if you're mandated on a tool, great, you've got to work within that framework and and get it to the extent you can. Yeah. So the maintenance side, we're going to um, uh, show a good example here of a couple different ways um, that we handle the whole maintenance side. Even if we're going to take it to the maximum, right? Let's take it to the ultimate tool, like what we believe is the ultimate interactivity for HTML5. And how can you maintain that without instructional designers or without developers, right? Yeah. Because the course was solid on design, so it's not like you need ID resources. You just need maintenance. And and I think that, that this is a, a good example of where you, you probably could not do this in Storyline. Um, but... <laughs> you might be able to do one interaction, but you couldn't do it as a as a template that flowed in external content that that allow you to update, change, and, and easily modify it on the fly. And that's what this requirement was. So uh, again, it's just knowing those goals, mm -hmm. knowing what you you need to get out of your learning, and be able to uh, you know transition to those tool sets that are going to give you that. Yeah, so, let me give you, that, that's excellent. We should get a little context on that. So when you think of Caribou and when they're um, onboarding their team leaders, and now it's Caribou, Einstein, Bagels. So you, you think of those menus and right, there's hundreds of drink choices and then throw that on, at a hundred of bagel sandwiches with it yeah. too. It can be overwhelming for these, you know, team members starting. So they wanted to make sure that they could slice and dice their training, no pun intended, if maybe they want the team member to just really get rock solid at the three major drinks that that particular store sells. Well, the three major drinks that are probably selling in Pensacola, Florida in February are not the same three drinks that are selling in Minneapolis, Minnesota in February. So each store and region wanted to be able to take the training and modify it for their uses. If they had a special promotion at the holidays, they wanted to change it. So we we couldn't be creating hundreds of courses for them, but what we could create is one back end that accommodated so they can slice and dice it however they want. And Scott will show you that back end, but that was kind of the driver as yeah. to why it was so critical for them. So I, I just want to go through a little bit of this and show you. So um, there's a couple of modes. This is allowing them to practice building drinks and thinking about ingredients and how they'd put it together before they actually got on and, and mm -hmm. used real ingredients <laughs> and real customers. Um, so 
when we go to practice here, we, we can select a category. You can type one in if you want to search for the one you want to make. Um, but if we went to, let's say, iced recipes um, and went to a, a iced Americano. Nothing like picking the easiest one. Yeah, well, I don't, I don't, I don't know how to make it. Um, and, uh, and then saying, okay, we're going to do a, a large size of that. Now, what's going to happen is you're going to get a bunch of, of different uh, options. So this is a multiple choice question engine, if you will, that, that is creating a simulation. So the first thing I need, I think, is, is ice. So I'm going to click on ice and move that in. I need some half and half, some espresso, and, and I think that's all I need. And then I'm going to submit that. Um, sorry, you didn't gather the right ingredients. Try again. Okay. So you can go look it up in recipes. I, I could go to. look it up. Um, <laughs> Learners don't like to do that, though. They just like to play and experiment. Yeah. Um, oh, do I need water? Okay. So I could go actually go out to the recipes and, and take a look. You can see that there's this timer moving down because speed is of the essence. Um, after I got the right uh, the right components, then I would actually have to go and 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 build this thing, build this thing, and put you know two shots of espresso on the bottom. I need you know half and half. I need ice. I need to shake it. Um, but but this is the same exact same interface for hundreds and hundreds of drinks and um, and and sandwiches. Now. If I wanted to change that, let's say let's go back to the main menu and say instead of having all these ice recipes, I just want the first three for whatever reason. Um, I can go out to this uh, interface that we've designed called Quick Change, and I can say I want to edit uh, the spreadsheet uh, or the Google Sheet that actually contains all of that data that's populating that engine, that practice learning engine. And if I look at products, I can scroll down and hear all my hot recipes, my iced, my blended. Um, I can see all the recipes for all those different products are in here. Um, I can look at the ingredients for everything and what icon I use with that. Um, but let's say I wanted to just get rid of, uh, let's say, I'm going to delete these. And then uh, I'm going to go back to Quick Change, and I'm going to say load this data. Oops. I'm going to have to refresh that. Load. I'm hoping if I uh, I did it correctly. Oh, I have to go back and and load the data again press this page okay there's little things like refreshing and things like that that have to happen are you using xml for this data uh yes thank yep. you okay so let's load that data and see if that worked Okay. Launch the module. And now you can see that we've we've taken off and only have three of those iced coffees that now that learner can go through. This can be done with any of the products. It can be done with ingredients. You can add products. Um, and and while these examples could be done in, say, Storyline or Captivate or Lectora, that whole dynamic engine of data coming in, data changing, would not be possible. Um, and, and this is also, uh, I believe this is a responsive design. So as I, as I change the size of this, you can see that, uh, that these components um, then would be responsive on a phone. You could do this on a phone or a, uh, a, a laptop. Can you show the edit interface one more time real quick? Sure. Thank you. So so this is the this is the the portal that gets you into the content. There's the ability to to edit the spreadsheet, which is all of our data that's that's populating that course. Um, once I've made that those edits, I then have to click this button, which actually 
takes all that data in the spreadsheet and exports it out to an XML file that then gets loaded uh, to the correct location. Um, and then when I launch the module, it's going to launch and pull in that, that XML uh, structure that I just created and launch the course. So, Is there a back-end server side to this? Um, this one, uh, I believe, does have a back-end server side, yes. And yep. we wrote the back-end, didn't we, or did someone else? We wrote the back-end, yep. Back this is all something that we had done from a technological standpoint, from the portal to quick change. The, so again, I think I think what we're trying to show is, and just talk through that there are lots of different ways that you can handle this, these conversions, um, but knowing the, you know, what those things are, knowing what to think about, um, trying to envision new ways of, of serving up and, and changing and editing and modifying content uh, through these multiple um, delivery devices is, is very important. Sometimes, you know, if you, there are still companies, there are still people we know that just say, you know what, this is going to be taken on a PC. I don't care about adaptive, responsive, or any of that, which is fine. A lot of these concepts still hold true, though, um, even if you're not going to that resizing and reformatting, you know, component. Um, so. And a couple of people had really good suggestions, too. Um, Andrew, thank you for your suggestion about the open source software of Bracket and Sublime. Thank you. And then also Mark on Visual Studio Code, which is... Yeah, and we, we definitely yep. use, you know, different uh, JavaScript um, components and, and uh, you know, we use anything that's available can be used in, in these, uh, these designs to, to help that as well. So um, thank, thank you. Perfect. Um, just a note on the um, maintenance issue too, that he was showing a quick change tool, tool with the um, Google Sheets backend, but we've also built them where it's just a forms-based um, or an XML spreadsheet or a um, GUI interface overlay too. Right. So good. Do you want to recap the last this piece? And for a lot of these technical questions, please feel free to reach out to Lisa during office hours, or we can also set up, um, you can respond to the email that you get uh, with the link in it, and we can set up some private um, time for you to discuss tool sets and any other technical questions that we don't cover up on today. What I, what I want to do with this, I, I, I wasn't able to get the, the correct ingredients on that <laughs> first one, so I thought I'd do a simple cappuccino. Um, so I got the right ingredients. And then uh, the next thing is you have to then understand, okay, the first thing is you put an espresso and because it's a large, I do four shots. Um, I'm going to put in some steamed milk. And uh, in this particular case, you're actually having to put things in the right order and then delete things that uh, you don't need to do. So I don't need to, to do that. I don't, uh, I might need that. Um, so, so here's an ordering and uh, uh, get rid of the, the distractors type of, of, of interaction, I think, which is, is pretty unique. I probably didn't get that right. Um, and then I'm going to add some froth, and I need to uh, do, do that. And sorry, I didn't get it quite right, uh, but I can look at the details, and it's going to tell me what order I did it and what things I got wrong. Um, there's some badging in it. So again, you know, these things, this could not be done with those standard tool sets, but given that ability, HTML5 allows us to, to design something this way. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it was an easier lift for Caribou, right? Because we just yes. built the um, structure and framework and they populated all and the they, content. Yeah, and anytime anything changes, they just go in and change those spreadsheets and republish it and, and they've got a new course they can send to any location, uh, which is great. All right. So uh, again, uh, just to, to kind of sum up, we've got a, a, just a couple minutes. Um, you know, thinking about maintenance and rework, depending on the tool set, is very important. Um, potentially, uh, device playback design and how you want that, uh, that learner experience if you're going to be porting your content over to multiple types of devices. Um, Chunking and sequencing, uh, understanding can I break this up into smaller micro-sized bytes uh, such that uh, like Manhattan did, that was a, a big part of their initiative. Um, these are all components that, uh, that we hope you, you've learned a little bit about um, and we would also love to help you think through or, uh, or help you know, 
design and, and convert uh, any courses you might uh, you might have out there. Um, again, thanks for Stephan to Stephanie for uh, stepping in and, and telling a little bit from a client's perspective on what they did and why they did it. Um, yeah, and we um, invite everyone to join us at the Allen Experience as part of the training online conference um, in Chicago this year, October 8th. So you'll probably be getting loads of emails from Hillary on that. Many emails, <laughs> and watch our social channels for all the info on registration. Yep, perfect. Love to see you there. And thank you, Hillary, for um, all your tech help on this and your help. And um, Rich, thank you. We know you're out there. Uh, monitoring the back channel. Thanks so much. As Hillary mentioned earlier, the learning never stops. So I have do have office hours from 2 to 4 every Thursday. Otherwise, feel free to email or call anytime. If I can't answer your question, we have lots of good guilds and help here, and uh, we'll get you the answers you need to keep the learning alive. Scott, thank you so much. Any final comments? No. Thanks, Lisa. Yep. For being our host, and uh, everybody have a great rest of their Thursday. Yeah, awesome. Thanks, everyone.